Well, good morning, Westmead family. Thank you so much for being a part of our time together again, or maybe it's your first time. Uh, whatever it is, thank you for choosing to be with us this morning uh, as we seek to engage the living God through his holy word. Uh, thank you for being a part of it. It's Sunday morning. It is exciting. You might still be in bed watching this, and if so, that's fine. Uh, I'm just thankful that we get to spend time together. But wherever you are and whoever you're with, uh, just be encouraged at knowing that there's a whole lot of other church family members watching this together. So uh, in a way, while we can't be in the same room, we're still united. Uh, I'm delighted to get to be with you today. And as you can tell, we're going to do something a little different today. We were talking about it last week. Uh, and we just came up with the idea of, you know, while we're, while we're doing this thing on video, why don't we do some things that we can do on video that we can't do live? Uh, so we're just going to kind of do something a little different today. So uh, we'll see what happens, but we're excited to be together today. Before we start, uh, I just want to deliver a personal message. Today is March 29th, 2020. And two years ago, my daughter gave her life to Christ on March 29th. So today is her birthday in Jesus. So Happy birthday, baby girl. I'm proud of you. Uh, so anyway, we're going to keep moving on. Even though it, it is March 29th, and, and had we been in our normal schedule, today we would have been celebrating the Lord's Supper together as a family. Now, here's what I want to assure you. The first Sunday that we're able to gather again under one roof, we're going to have Lord's Supper on that day, because that day is going to be a great celebration uh, of being reunited with our family, but it's also going to be a great celebration of continuing to celebrate what the Lord Jesus has done uh, by giving us the privilege of salvation through his blood. Uh, so we're going to celebrate that when we get back together again, have no doubt. Uh, but while, while we aren't able to celebrate in the Lord's Supper together, I do want us to think about that day when we come back together. You know, right now, with everything that's going on in our culture and in our, in our community and in our world, um, there's been a lot of questions that we've been asking. There's been a lot of questions that are asked on the television, and probably the same questions I've been asking are the same ones you've been asking. Questions like, man, how did this, how did this happen so quickly? Or, or how much longer is it going to be this way? Or, or when, will is it ever, when will it ever end? Or, or maybe the question I find myself asking, since we have such an ever-evolving culture of what happens next with the coronavirus and uh, the mandates and everything that's put into place, my big question has been like, man, what in the world's going to happen next? And these are all great questions. They're all, they're all viable questions. Um, but this morning, I, I want us to kind of not ask those unanswerable questions for a little bit. This morning, I would like for us to kind of focus on some questions that we can answer. Uh, and not necessarily, I'm fixing to go through a whole list of questions or anything, but uh, I really just want us to look at one question this morning as we walk through this together. We're talking about kneading the dough, uh, and we're going to dive into that in just a minute as we look in the book of John chapter 13, but, but I want to ask you this question this morning. When we do gather back together, who will we be when we come back together and meet under one roof? Who will we be? And we can ask all the other questions, but we're not going to get answers to them. And the only way we're going to get the right answer to the question of who will we be when we gather again is by seeking the face of God and bringing our hearts before him and saying, God, during this time, we know what's going on. But when we get back together, who will we be? And it's not for any one person to sit on their couch or wherever they are and answer the question for Westmead Baptist Church. We can't do that. But it is up to us to answer that question individually. When I come back to being a part of our church family fellowship together in person, who am I going to be? And who will I be when we come to the table? Uh, I want us to ask the question, who will I be when we come back together? But before we try to figure out the definitive answer to that question, that's something that hopefully God's going to continue to walk with you through it during this time of, of isolation. I want us to go back to the Lord's Supper, because that's what we would be doing today is the Lord's Supper. And I want us to talk about that this morning, and I want us to think about that incredible night in the upper room. Uh, you know, in the upper room, uh, the night uh, that Jesus was uh, betrayed and arrested and just got everything started, which is kind of good for us to be talking about this as we are entering into our Easter season, uh, there was several amazing things that took place in the upper room. 
um, two very specific and significant things happened in the upper room the night of the Lord's Supper. The first of which is the Lord's Supper, absolutely. Uh, but the other thing that took place in that room uh, was that was when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Uh, it happened uh, on the same night. It happened in the same gathering time. And uh, we have the, the beautiful picture of the Lord's Supper happening in Matthew. Uh, but, but in John chapter 13, we kind of see what happens before the Lord's Supper uh, with, the, with the washing of the disciples' feet. Uh, so uh, I want us to think about that night. And if you can, just even if you want to hit pause... Uh, and just kind of take a minute to discuss it with your family. It's entirely up to you. But I just want you to think, like, man, what, would it, what must it have been like to be in that room the night that Jesus washed his disciples' feet and, and walked them through the Lord's Supper? Man, what if, what if you could have been in the room and you're sitting there and you're reclining at the table and then Jesus comes to you to wash your feet. Man, what, what must have that felt like? What, what must have that been like? Man, what goes through your mind if, if you're one of those disciples at that moment? But, but think about that night. You know, Jesus washed their feet. Jesus uh, gave them the Lord's Supper. And in both of these incredible instances, we see, we see Jesus do the same thing. And when he, when he washed the disciples' feet, he served them by washing their feet. And then when he, when he administered the Lord's Supper to them, he served them the food and the drink. Jesus served. And, and of all the beautiful implications that we could take out of that night in the upper room, we can't look past that privilege that Jesus served. And with that in mind, I want to, I want to ask you to, to turn your attention to John chapter 13. And if you don't have your Bible, I encourage you, hit pause, go get a Bible uh, so you can look at God's word with me. Uh, I know it's going to be here on the screen, uh, but I think it's just, it, 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 it means something more when we can hold God's word in our hands and look at it with our own eyes. Uh, it also means something to our family uh, when we value it that much. So grab your copy of God's word. And in John chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 1, you see this narrative of what happens when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And it's really cool as he's going around the table. Uh, he gets to Peter, who, of course, <clears throat> has to do Peter-like things and uh, be the loud mouth, like, hey, Jesus, you, you, you're not going to wash my feet, which is probably what a lot of us would say. No, Jesus, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, hey, if somebody's going to be a part of me, I'm going to wash their feet. And he said, well, if you're talking about being a part of you, then wash my whole body. I want to be completely immersed in you. And I love Peter's passion and his excitement uh, and his love for Jesus. And he said, you know what? If anybody who's had a bath is already clean, but their, their feet is really the only thing that needs to be washed. So he washes Peter's feet. He washes Judas's feet, even though in just a little bit later, and even in this text, he alludes to the fact that, that Judas is going to betray him. He still gets on, down on his knees and washes Judas's feet. Different sermon, different day. But I want us to pick up in verse 12. So look in John chapter 13, verse 12 with me for a minute. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Wow. Uh, it's an amazing passage of scripture. And I want us to just spend some time this morning talking about this and, and trying to figure out what does this look like? And not necessarily what did it look like for them, because we can't possibly imagine what it was like to be in that room. But maybe to take this and, and say, what does that look like for us? Well, well, let's ask the question, what did it look like for the disciples? I mean, you look at this, and this is the last night that Jesus was with them before he's crucified. And, and he uses this, this very strong word when he's talking to them. He says, I've, I've set you an example. 
And you think about the three years of Jesus' ministry, and you think about the time, all the time that he spent with the disciples, whether it was they had a front row seat seeing him teach and seeing him love people, uh, whether he was teaching them and just spending time with them, whether it was something he said or something he did, he was constantly giving them an example of what God was going to ultimately tell us as well as telling them, that, hey, this is, this is how I want you to do it. This is what it looks like when you do it in a way that glorifies God the Father. And the crazy thing is about the disciples is they still got it wrong. They still messed up. I mean, they still had a front row seat to see Jesus do these incredible things that Jesus did. And we all look all throughout the Gospels and we see them just miss it. They just miss it. You know, talking about Easter, one of, one of the one of the most clear ways that we can look at the disciples and just be like, man, they, they just totally whiffed on that one was after Jesus was crucified and he was dead. What did the disciples do? They went and hid. They went and locked themselves in a room or in a house. We can kind of relate to that part of the story right now and, and, and how we're just isolated. That's what they did. They went and isolated themselves. They were walked with Jesus for three years, and he was trying to show them, and he was trying to teach them, and he was trying to prepare them for the ministry that they would continue. And what do we see them do time and time again? They missed it. And after he's crucified, they go and lock themselves in a room. Hmm. I want to hold on to that thought, and I want to tell you a story. When I was a kid, when I was a real little kid, um, Every Saturday morning was biscuit breakfast Saturday, which is tricky to say a lot. Every Saturday morning, we had the same breakfast in our house, and, and it, was, it was fried eggs, and it was, oh man, hot grits, butter, perfectly buttered. It was juicy sausage or either really crispy bacon you know the way yeah you might not like it crispy i do all right um but it was always cooked perfectly but the creme de la creme the the centerpiece of it all was mom's homemade biscuits uh and man i loved those homemade biscuits i still love homemade biscuits for anybody who's just bored out of your mind at your house i'll help you eat biscuits uh, but this morning i want to kind of show you why i love those biscuits so um give me just a minute um, I got to get my stuff here. And like I said, this is the advantage of video. We get to do things a little differently. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, I spared no expense today for you because I went with the, the OG buttermilk. So we're going to try this right here all together uh, on this table, which is why it would be best to use this table. And yes, I'm wearing an apron. So uh, we're going to try this and see what happens, obviously. Uh, because we don't have an oven on the, the platform in the worship center, um, and I'm not advocating that we do so when we go debt-free or anything. I'm just making a, an obvious statement. Uh, we don't have an oven. We won't be baking biscuits today, but we're going to make biscuits uh, today, and I want to show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, so when I was a kid, every Saturday, I'd get up, and, and I would go into uh, the kitchen where mom was, and I, and I always knew kind of when it was time to make biscuits. And sometimes she would just call me. She's like, hey, I'm making biscuits. And she'd get herself rising flour. And it feels like a cooking show now, doesn't it? Feels like you need to like go be in front of your kitchen or something. Don't worry about it. You can hit replay later. Uh, she'd get herself rising flour and she'd put it in her little bowl. And, uh, and, 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 and what was happening, because I was so little, when I was a kid, I would come into the kitchen and she'd pick me up and put me on the counter, right? And I was the right size that I was sitting on the counter. I would fit perfectly between the countertop and the bottom of the cabinets. Uh, so I would just get in that little nook uh, that all good chefs know. Uh, you can't really use that space for anything other than setting things aside. Uh, and I would get right there. And I would just sit there and watch my mom make homemade biscuits. And, uh, and she would tell me stories. And she would talk to me about all this stuff. Uh, and, and I listened most of the time. But I was really just keen on one thing, and it wasn't just the biscuits, it was a very unique aspect of the biscuits that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. Uh, but she would make biscuits every Saturday, and man, I would get so excited. Uh, and of course, I would sit there and, and watch her make biscuits and do her thing, and, 
uh, wait for the perfect thing, my favorite part about her making biscuits, and then whenever we got done with the perfect part, whenever she put the biscuits on the baker and put them in the oven, man, I was out. Uh, I, was, I was headed to the den or I was headed somewhere else so I could go watch some Saturday morning cartoons, RIP Saturday morning cartoons, uh, because they were the best ever. And, uh, but man, it was so good. And then I'd be watching cartoons for a little while, and my mom was really good because she always knew how long and how to prepare and time everything out to where the bacon or the sausage or both and the grits and the biscuits would all get done about the same time and she would crack the eggs and fry up the eggs for us right there to where when we came and sat down at the table, it was all hot, it was all fresh out of the oven or fresh out of the skillet or whatever, and it was perfect. Now, we have some dough here, which is really good. So this is what we're going to do now. This was my favorite part of mom making breakfast, right? So she would get the countertop good and cleaned off. Uh, I do this now because I don't want to mess anything up too bad, which is probably you're sitting in your room thinking, too late, I'm turning this off. Uh, and if that's the case, then we don't have to worry about your opinions anymore because you're done watching. But uh, what my favorite part was when she would get her flour and she'd pour it all out on the counter, you know what I mean? And some of y'all, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And she'd get all her flour spread out and then the funnest part, she would take her flour or her dough and she would dump it out just like that. Dump it out just like that, right? And uh, obviously, with everything coronavirus going around, I did wash my hands, uh, but it's not like you're going to be eating these biscuits anyway. So uh, I'm going to use my bare hands, and I'm not using rubber gloves or a mask or anything else. But this was my favorite part. And when we make biscuits at my house, this is my kid's favorite part, the dough. Man, I loved playing with the dough. Some of you still love playing with the dough. Don't lie. I know who you are. You know who you are. You can't hide from the Lord either. Uh, but man, we love playing with the dough. But here's the difference, all right? And, and again, we're talking about practice and vulnerability. I showed you a pound puppy last week. Might as well just keep going on, let you know how weird, uh, how weird I am and, you know, let you look hard in the mirror and recognize what's going on. But uh, I loved the biscuit dough because you get to play with the dough. And I left my uh, biscuit cutter at the house, so I'm going to use a jar. But what would happen is my mom would pat it out like this. She would knead it, just like we did a minute ago, kneading the dough, kind of, you know, get it to where it's good and fun to play with. Doesn't it look good? And then she would roll it out or flatten it out like this, like I'm doing with my hand. And then she would start cutting, just like that. Now, here's where it gets weird, all right? Just warning you, you're still watching. So here's where it gets weird. As I was sitting in my little nook, underneath the counter or underneath the cabinets and on top of the counter. I loved playing with the dough, but eventually mom said, stop playing with the dough. And she would start cutting out the biscuits. But sometimes I would cut out the biscuits. My mom was smart. She would let me cut out the biscuits because if I was cutting out the biscuits, then I wasn't doing what she hated me doing. And it was this. Mm. See, some, some kids... Our cookie dough, kids, you know what I mean? You're making chocolate chip cookies, they're going to be sitting there hammering the cookie dough, right? Not me. I was a biscuit dough kid. And my main reason for sitting around watching my mom make biscuits was that she was making it, got to this point, and kneading the dough and rolling it out. Man, I'd grab that dough, mm, and I'd eat it. And man, I was so fast as a kid, I'd get some in my hand, and my mom would be like, don't you do it. And before she even got that out of her mouth, it was already down the hatch, you know what I mean? And I'm really not trying to gross anybody out. I'm just showing you, like, I loved biscuit dough. I kind of still do because I realized how good it is when I just ate some a minute ago. And she would sit there, so she would use literally every piece of biscuit dough that she possibly could because the more she used, the less I could eat, which is really messed up. But that's the beauty of moms because they look past, it's, it's like, that's where they exemplify Jesus. You know, they love covers a multitude of sins. And, uh, my mama still loved me even though I ate biscuit dough. So for those of you who are uh, judging me right now, it don't matter. Jesus loves me. Uh, and he loves you too, but that's good. So we would get these incredible biscuits made. And I hope these are incredible biscuits. And then she would take her baker. She'd 
take her baker out and she'd pour some oil on it. And because, uh, you know, you don't want them to stick to the pan. So we're going to do this right here. And uh, you're sitting at home thinking, oh, my gosh, this is boring. This is horrible. Well, just hang with me a little bit. We're going to go somewhere with this. But right now, we're just putting biscuits on the plate. So we put all our biscuits on the, on the baker, which was always fun, too. But also kind of sad because when it came time to putting the biscuits on the baker, you knew it was almost over. The biscuit dough was about to be gone, and there wouldn't be anything to eat until next Saturday. Psych. I'm just kidding. There would be something to eat in about, you know, 15 minutes when the biscuits were going to be done, and we could all sit down and, and gorge ourselves. But I'll get to that in just a minute. Yeah, that, that one will fit right there. Look at there. Not bad, huh? I'm going to go home and, and bake these when we're done, and I'll put a picture on Facebook. See what you think, I and mean, you can judge me and do whatever you want to do. Or you might want to try this recipe, um, which isn't really a recipe now that I think about it. So, but we would do that every single Saturday. And then, the greatest part of all of it was when we get done, I'd clean my hands off like I'm doing now. I'd go back in and I'd watch my cartoons. And then, oh, and then, the greatest thing would happen. We'd be sitting there watching our cartoons, and then I'd hear mom say, come on in, it's time to eat, which is kind of one of my favorite words that I heard my mom say growing up. It's time to eat, and dude, you know sometimes when you got to tell your kids three or four times to do something, and they just still sit there in front of the TV, or they sit there in front of their phone or whatever, man, my mom only had to say it once. It's time to eat, bro, TV was going off, everything was getting out of the way. And we were sprinting to the kitchen because when we got to the kitchen, man, there it was. There was the spread. There was the fried eggs. And there was the bacon. And there was the sausage. But there were these incredible golden brown biscuits. And that was my favorite part. I loved playing with the dough. And I loved eating biscuit dough. And even though that's disgusting and gross. Oh, there went my microphone. But my favorite part was eating the biscuits. B eating biscuit dough is gross. I get it. But do you know why eating biscuits was my favorite part? Do you know why eating the dough was not my favorite part? Because just because of the biscuit dough, it was still not the finished product. It was good, but it wasn't what we all were waiting on. It wasn't exactly what we were hoping for. We were waiting on those biscuits. We were waiting for the dough to be cooked so that we could eat what it is that's been being prepared the entire time. So I want us to look back at these disciples. Because at this stage, when Jesus is washing their feet and he's meeting with them in the upper room, just hang with me for a while. I know it might sound lame, but this was kind of the dough stage. For them. Jesus had assembled these guys. Uh, he had put these guys together. All of them had unique gifts and talents, and he combined them all together. And for three years, he poured into them, and he invested in them, and he showed them things, and he taught them things, and they got to listen to him teach things, and they got to see him do things. And it all comes down to exactly what Jesus says in this passage when he washes their feet. And he says to them, hey, do you, do you understand what I did? I can imagine it was probably pretty quiet because somebody was sitting there thinking, I think he just washed our feet, but it's got to be something bigger than that, so I'm just not going to say a word. He said, I have just set an example for you so that you will know how to serve and love one another. I have just showed you exactly what I want you to do by doing it for you. First, Jesus was saying and showing them, this is who I want you to be. So when you think about those three years of ministry with Jesus, you think about those three years that the disciples were with Christ. It's kind of like that was their dough period. That was their dough time that, that Jesus just in his very unique and very patient way was just shaping them. And forming them and working everything in together and bringing it all together. 
making it something. But that was kind of the point of the whole thing. When Jesus was giving him these examples, of course he knew they were going to get it wrong. And even after Christ ascended later, he knew that, hey, they're still humans. They're still going to make mistakes. But he knew that things were going to happen. He knew that when he was crucified, they were going to go back to the upper room and just totally miss the whole point of what was going on. But he continued to work with them and shape them and pour into them and invest in them. They were the dough. But see, that's also the point of why Jesus raising again from the grave three days later, conquering sin on the cross, conquering death from the grave, uh, and then showing the glory of God in all of this. Because where we found the disciples in John chapter 13, that's not the finished product yet. And Jesus was, was showing them that. So what's the point? What's the point in making biscuits and having a table and talking about something and how do we connect the two? Well, here we are. Or <laughs> I guess technically here we aren't since I'm talking to a big empty worship center. And that's the question I want to take you back to that I encouraged you with earlier. One day we're going to be back here. One day we're going to fill these buildings with joy and laughter, and we're going to be excited to see each other again, and we're going to be back here getting to be the church together. But I ask you the same question as I asked earlier, who are you going to be when you come back? Who will you be when we gather together again? I want to think about maybe right now, I've heard several people make this statement. You know, since we've not been able to come to church, I'll never take for granted again the privilege of meeting together. I'll never just lackadaisically lay out on a Sunday because now I see how much I miss it. I'm not going to just look past Sunday morning anymore. I had somebody tell me, like, I, I'm going to start coming on Wednesdays now because, man, I really miss being with my church family. And that's God awakening in us that passion and that desire to be with the brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That, that sometimes it's good for us to recognize that it's not until we, something is taken away that we realize how bad we missed it. And maybe that's where a lot of us are. Maybe that's our little dough stage right now is, is we're sitting in our homes and we're kind of isolated or quarantined or whatever terminology they're using. And, and we're just kind of sitting where we are thinking, man, I really really not going to miss those opportunities whenever those come back around again. But before those come back around again, I believe God is constantly, every day in our lives, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and hold ourselves to the standard of Christ, pointing out some imperfections in our life saying, hey, but I'm not, this is not, you're not the finished product yet. There's something that he's equipping us to do. There's something that he's calling us to do. And if we hold it to what Jesus shows here, it's service. Jesus set the example to the disciples and said, I'm going to serve you so that you can be the example to those who come behind you and you serve them. Well, why did he serve them? So they would have the example. But why else did he serve them? So they would know and get a picture of how God loved them and what God was doing for them in their lives. Look at us. We're at a place right now that we're not able to meet. We're not able to gather. We're scattered out all over neighborhoods and communities and all over the county and some even outside the county. And I'm asking you this question. Maybe you don't even go to Westmead Baptist Church. I'm asking you this question. When, when you're able to go back and be a part of your church family, who are you going to be when you get there? In this dough period, what is God shaping? How is God shaping you? How is he molding you? How is he kind of folding some things in and, and stretching you out a little bit? Stretching you to a place where you recognize, man, it's not just the value of when we get to meet together, but that's kind of all I ever did. I just kind of showed up. You know, when you go and you look at the purpose of the church, and I'm not saying, we know the purpose of the church is to reach the lost with the gospel of Christ. And that's what we should all be doing individually as well as corporately. But when, when we look at the privilege of what we have, when we gather together, when we come into a place like this one, 
What's the purpose of us joining up with a church body of believers? What is the purpose of us joining with a church family? There's two purposes. We've talked about this before. The purpose of us coming in and coming alongside a church family is to grow in our own personal faith and our own walk with Christ. And it's to serve. It's to serve the Lord by ministering to the body of believers and to any, bir- any person that comes in these doors. Ministering by serving any person that we have the privilege of reaching out in our communities, in our homes, in our schools, wherever we go. Our purpose as the church when it comes time for us to meet together is to grow and to serve. So I'm just going to ask you this question. How, how are you doing on those two things? Do we show up to church just to get what we want out of it? Or are we showing up to church because we're hungry? We're hungry for the word of God to be broken to us and fed to us in the context of Sunday school. We're hungry for the word of God that when we come in this room and whoever stands behind the pulpit is to open God's word and to share it and to teach us and to show us what it means. Are we hungry for that? Maybe as we miss this time, this is our third Sunday not meeting together, maybe we're starting to realize, man, there was something more that I really didn't really press into the way I should have. But let's take it beyond just the grow and how we grow in our relationship with Christ. When you think about the church, when we think about the day that we're all going to come back together again, I'm asking you another question. How do you serve the Lord in the context of your church family? How do you serve? How do you serve the Lord? You're not serving Westmead. Man, if we're sitting here trying to serve and please one another, we miss the point entirely. And then it's like Jesus with the disciples, like, oh, are you serious? You missed the point again? Except Jesus wasn't frustrated like that. I, I would be. But how do you serve the Lord in the context of the church that you're a part of? You know, when we talk about serving, when we talk about serving in, in the context of, of our church, Man, a lot of times, the first thing that comes to our mind is, well, how much time are we talking about here? What's it going to cost me? Remember last week when we talked about the difference between how the world gives and how Jesus gives? Uh, we're very much still on the world side in a lot of areas in our life because we're fallen. We're, we're sinful human natures that we deal with. And when it comes time to serving in our church, uh, I don't know enough. I, I, man, I'm, I'm not here every Sunday. Man, we can find excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. We always are concerned about what it's going to cost us. But what if we changed our perspective? What if instead of when we came to the idea of serving, by the example that Jesus served by getting on his hands and washing the feet of his disciples, and then turning around and serving them a meal because he cared about them, because he loved them. What if instead of what is it going to cost me, what if the question was, well, how can God use me? What can God do through me? And we have incredible people in our church that serve. They serve with excellence. I I gave her a heads up that I might brag on her. Last Sunday morning, I had a voicemail from Miss Benita Wiley. Uh, and I love Miss Benita, and I got the chance to talk to her afterwards, and I hate that I missed her call, but on my, my voicemail, she said, hey, Justin, it's, it's Miss Benita. It's my Sunday to serve as a greeter, and since we're not meeting, I figured I would do it this way. So good morning. Hope you have a great day. Uh, looking forward to, to our sermon this morning. Hope you have a great day. Tell your wife and your children I said good morning, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Made my day, man. Made my day. That here is someone who is so passionate about continuing to serve the Lord by ministering to their church family that even though she's at home isolated, she was calling people and and greeting them, still doing her job from home. Nobody ever would have thought, you know, we got to start doing our jobs from home. How do I be a greeter from home? Uh, And now, of course, everybody in the room that's a greeter is like, oh, I guess I got to start making phone calls. No, I'm not trying to dump that on you or force you into that. I'm just using it as an example of what a beautiful picture of serving. And I ask you the same question again. How do you serve the Lord in the context of your local church? And instead of asking the question, well, what's it going to cost me? Because don't we kind of make big deals out of little bitty small things? You mean I got to show up to church 15 minutes early if I'm going to serve on this team? 
You mean that once a month I can't sit with my, with my family? Do you mean, the, and we fill in the blank, how much time are we talking about here? How much, serve them a security team? Like, I mean, I might not get to do... Uh, what if your service, what if the way that you served the Lord because of your love for the Lord was the deciding factor in someone else coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Would it still be about what it cost you? Or suddenly would it be about, look what God can do through me? When Jesus served the disciples by washing their feet, It was something simple, it was something subtle, but it was a huge deal because it painted the picture of Christ's love for them. That's the point of our service. That's why we serve, is so that others would see that Jesus loves them that much. Who are you going to be when you come back and gather here with us? Are we going to be the same people? Are we going to be the same people that, that were here four weeks ago, since this is our third Sunday, so four weeks ago was the last time we were Are we going to be the same people that fills this place? Or are we going to come back recognizing the value and the privilege we have of meeting together and worshiping God together and exalting the name of Christ high above ours or any other name? Are we going to get into the, the, the joy that we have of being the church and in doing so, love each other as Christ loved the church by serving and meeting needs? Many of you are doing this now, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. This coming week, we're going to be serving children in our area and meeting needs, and many of you have signed up to help serve, and thank you so much for that. But is that all we're going to do? Are we just going to do things to make us feel good about ourselves? Or are we going to actually serve the Lord by showing others the love Christ has for them and building his kingdom in that way? Look again at what Christ says in this passage of scripture. Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Jesus says, now that I, and he reminds them of who they declare him to be. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. Look in verse 15. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus was the example. He was showing them how to do it. He was molding them and shaping them into what he would do and how he would do it and what he looks like so that they could in turn do the same exact things to show other people how Jesus loves them. This is how we're called to serve. This is how we're called to reach out and to show others the love of Christ. Again, it's cheesy and I hope you, and I know, but this is the dough period to elect God to be forming us and shaping us now where we are in our homes and why we can't have this social interaction that let God be shaping and forming us and making us into what it is that he wants us to be so that we, the church, can show others the love of Christ practically by how we serve them. Westmead, we're not there yet. Man, we've got some amazing people and some amazing ministries. We have ushers and we have greeters and we have security team members and we have Sunday school teachers. We have, man, I could go all day long. We have incredible people who are serving in some incredible ways. But then we got some people that just want to come and fill a pew. And, and I know we have some people who are physically limited in their ability to serve. And I'm not disqualifying you. Please don't think I'm disqualifying you. I'm not trying to force anybody's hand or, or trying to guilt trip anybody into do anything because our service should be an overflow of the heart. And if we're physically able to serve in a way, then we should. Why? Because Jesus did. And when he served, he looked at those in whom he served and he says, now this is what I want you to go do. This is how I want you to go serve. This is how I want you to look. I want you to look like this because I've showed you how to do it. And now it's your turn. Westmead, 
Now it's our turn. That I hope that whenever a day, the day is that we can come back into this place and we can fill these buildings and we can be in Sunday school together and we can come in this place and worship. And man, what a great celebration that is going to be. And I've already been praying, God, right now, where we are and how separated we are, will you continue to shape us and form us and mold us into what it is that you want us to become. God, I'm asking you to knead the dough that is our lives to bring us together and to work everything in to where it's a perfect combination that when we come to the place that we look exactly like we're supposed to look. So that when it's our turn to serve the way you have served us, God, that others would see the love of Christ by how we show them by serving them. Man, I pray when we come back together and we recognize, and a lot of us have already been there, and a lot of us have just been reminded of the value we have in worshiping and gathering together. Man, I hope we show up hungry. I hope we show up saying, I'm ready to serve. I hope people email me. I hope people call me. I hope people stop me in the pews or in the foyer and say, Justin, I'm ready to serve. I need to know where. And by the way, I love people. Some people say, I've been wanting to serve for a long time, just nobody's called me yet. I'm just going to be honest with you. There's a lot of people in our church, and we can't all just sit around and wait for a phone call if we know God is calling and equipping us for something. I've had a lot of conversations with people that are just like, hey, I, I want to serve. If you see a need, just let me know. I'll be glad to. But I love how we see all throughout Scripture that people were serving and then they saw the need. And then they altered how they served to meet that need. But they were serving based on their gifts, based on their strengths, and based on their passions. If you want to serve, then let's find a way for you to serve the Lord. You want to serve in the context of Westmead Baptist Church? Let's figure that out. And let's put you in a place where God can use you for his glory and his kingdom building. So that it's not about what it costs us, but it's about the glory of God that he would use us who are you going to be when we gather again church how will we be one step closer to being the people God has created to show others the love of Christ and we're going to run up in this room and try to find our favorite seat are we going to be so obsessed with with our pew or or our section that we miss seeing the people that right now, there's a lot of lost people asking a lot of questions right now. And when these doors open, those people are going to be in this place. Are you going to come in seeking how to make you happy? Are you going to come in seeking ways to serve the people that show up in this place so that they may see and know the love of Christ? If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we are tasked with the privilege of showing them what it looks like the way Jesus served us. How did he serve us? Sacrificially. He didn't worry about the cost. He didn't worry about what other people thought. He did what he did to honor God and bring glory to the Father. Will we be a church that does that? Will you be someone that says, God, what do you want me to be when I come back to my church family. This is our dough period. God is shaping us to what it is he wants us to be. But we're not there yet. But we will be. And I pray that every single one of us will place our hearts before the throne of God and say, God, here's, what, here's who I am. Make me who I need to be for your glory, for you to use so that others would see the love of Christ in me. I'm going to pray for you in just a minute, but I was reminded, y'all know the purpose of kneading the dough, right? The reason you knead the dough is because, well, when it gets put in the heat, it'll rise. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for your, your word. I thank you so much for the example that Christ gave us in John 13 and, and every other passage of scripture that we have that, that points to his amazing ability to serve and love people. 
God, I, I ask that you forgive me. I ask that corporately you forgive us when we make church about us and not about the glory of God and how you can use us to show others your glory and to show others how you love them. God, I pray that you would reach down in the lives of those who have a heart of stone and, and replace it with a heart of flesh that's molded by your hands. God, I thank you and I worship you so much for the people that you have called and you have raised up within our church to serve. That encourages me, Father, that points others to the love of Christ. I thank you for the people who are still serving you, God. But God, I pray today that we see in your word um, a motivating factor for us to, to evaluate ourselves and say that it's time for, for God to use me. We're getting a glimpse into the value of, of what we miss and, and the privilege we have of meeting together as the church, God. And I pray that we don't just sit back and wait for the doors to open so we can get what we want out of it. But God, that we would come to gather at this place, to gather in your house so that you would be exalted in our lives, in our words, and in our actions by how we serve. God, there are people that will be here in a few weeks or however long it is until we can gather again. God, there were people that will be here seeking you that do not know Jesus as Lord. May we be a place that receives them and shows them what they're looking for by how we allow you to shape and mold us into what that person will be then by submitting to your will now. God, I'm reminded in that last verse that Jesus shows us in verse 17. He says, now that you know what I've commanded you, you'll be blessed if you do it. God, now it's a matter of obedience. May we be found faithful to obey you. Now that you've shown us in your word what we were called to do and be. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of having a church family like Westmead. And I pray, Father, that we, when we gather again, will come with a hunger for you to make us more than we've ever been before, a beacon of light for others to see Jesus in not just what we say, but in how we serve. Thank you, God, for our time together this morning. Be with our people. Keep them safe. Protect them. God, lead them day by day for your kingdom and for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great Sunday. I miss you, and I look forward to seeing you whenever we can.